Ja, liebe Freunde, dear friends auf eine kleinen, der Miss Bühnenbände, der Barbara Benek, der Presana Ghetto. I'm very grateful for this very wonderful musical introduction to this evening. Today, uh, throughout the evening, we will be accompanied by Majuri, Reno, and Stephanie with uh, traditional Indian music, as you've heard just in the beginning. Prasanna already told us, oh, Indian music. Uh, this is an ensemble from Berlin. And we have chosen them to play this evening in order for us to have this uh, musical combination. The presentation of uh, the Women's Prize is uh, taking place under the conditions of the coronavirus. Um, up until this afternoon or this noon, we have pondered the risks of such a big event, and uh, we've concluded that uh, in any case, uh, we would like uh, to award our uh, dear Prasano Ghetto with a yeah, solemn ceremony. And I think... And I'm really happy about this applause because, as you might imagine, this is not really as easy as that to take the responsibility for this event. You're all responsible. We've taken some precautionary measures. And uh, this is why we uh, chose a different seating arrangement this year with a, a, a larger space between the seats. Uh, we have uh, chosen a different ventilation. And uh, of all those that did not find a seat, uh, in this room, we have two additional rooms that we provide for this occasion. And then downstairs, uh, there is additional space for people listening to us. Uh, although, of course, it is different being in here with us and uh, outside or following up on screen. I am still very happy to see you all here, despite the risks that uh, you might expose yourself to. And because of all these conditions, we hope that uh, many, many people will follow up on our live stream because this presentation, the ceremony will be uh, available on our live stream. And uh, we hope to have as many listeners as possible because uh, this is uh, the nice thing about this uh, prize uh, because uh, we've really achieved uh, to make people aware of uh, what is going on in the world. And every year we are awarding women for their special courage, for their special commitment for women's rights and against discrimination. And no matter where we will celebrate this evening, we will celebrate Anne Klein and uh, this year's winner, Dr. Prasanna Ghetto. As always, the ceremony starts with a short film in commemoration of uh, Anne Klein. And uh, so we have the possibility to get to know to her a little bit better. She gave us this award, and therefore we would like to, yes, um, commemorate her with this short film. <laughs> haben eine andere Vorstellung von Politik und eine andere Qualität von menschlichen Beziehungen, die sich auch in der Form der politischen Auseinandersetzung durchsetzen und zeigen wird. Anne Klein legte den Grundstein für einen neuen Stil in der Politik. Sie war Feministin, Anwältin und Notarin und die erste Senatorin in Berlin, die offen lesbisch lebte. Anne war Feministin und das hat man immer gemerkt bei allem, was sie getan hat, bei allem, über das sie nachgedacht hat, bei allen Positionen, die sie vertreten hat. Anne Klein war durch und durch Feministin und war durch und durch Juristin und sie kämpfte mit den juristischen Mitteln um die gleichen Rechte für Frauen und gegen Diskriminierung und sie bekämpfte insbesondere sehr leidenschaftlich, wenn Recht eingesetzt wurde, um Menschen zu diskriminieren. 1989 wurde Anne Klein unter Walter Momper im Berliner Senat, der wegen seiner Frauenmehrheit auch als Feminat bekannt wurde, Senatorin für Jugend, Frauen und Familie. Sie schwor ihren Eid mit den Worten, so war mir Göttin helfe. Sie hat sich als Feministin für Frauen- und Mädchenprojekte eingesetzt, hat dafür gesorgt, dass die gefördert werden, dass die eine politische Lobby bekommen. Und sie hat ähm, als Senatorin das Referat für gleichgeschlechtliche Lebensweisen ins Leben gerufen. Und sie hat sehr früh erkannt, ähm, dass es eigentlich darum geht, Institutionen zu schaffen, 
die plötzlich Kraft und Energie multiplizieren. Das hat sie dann richtig aufgenommen, um mal zu gucken, wo ist eigentlich der zentrale strukturelle Hebel, der ganz viel verändert. Anne Klein engagierte sich in der Berliner Frauenbewegung, war Mitbegründerin des ersten Frauenhauses in Berlin und stärkte die Rolle der Frauen in der Politik nachhaltig. Ja, Anne war rational und leidenschaftlich zugleich. Sie war nicht verbissen, aber sie kämpfte mit großer Leidenschaft und glaubte an das rationale Argument. Sie hatte sehr, sehr viel Charme. Sie war sehr offen gegenüber anderen Menschen. Und ich glaube, das hat bewirkt, dass sie tatsächlich überzeugend war und viele Freunde und Freundinnen hatte. Anne Klein äh, war eine Person, die immer furios bei der Sache war. Also so viel und breit gelebt hat, von Journalismus bis Reiseleiterin. Und sie war immer eine Anwältin, die sich in ganz besonderer Weise für die Mandantinnen und Mandanten eingesetzt hat, deren Vertretung sie übernommen hatte. Wirklich mehr als andere, sehr kämpferisch, sehr engagiert. Anne Klein konnte anderen Kraft geben, sie konnte anderen Mut geben, ermutigen, sich für äh, Frauenrechte gegen Diskriminierung einzusetzen. Also das war das Wunderbare an ihr. Ich glaube, was sie am meisten beeindruckt hat, war doch immer, dass Personen auch den Mut haben, den Finger gegen den Mainstream in eine Wunde zu legen. Auch den Mut zu haben, Dinge, die am Anfang noch obskur erscheinen, einfach auch anzusprechen. Deshalb freue ich mich, dass es einen anne klein -Preis gibt, der eines schaffen kann, nämlich Beharrlichkeit und Mut in solchen Bedingungen auch auszuzeichnen. Damit Frauen weiterhin öffentlich für ihr Engagement wahrgenommen und gefördert werden, hat Anne Klein den anne klein Frauenpreis gestiftet. Ach, der Preis, das war eigentlich eine ganz unfassbare Geschichte. Also ähm, ich, man hat ja nicht Erfahrung mit sowas. Und als es dann losging, war ich erst mal nur gerührt, und dann war das so, dass ich wahnsinnig überrollt war von dem öffentlichen Interesse, aber auch von dem Interesse der Leute, die ich kenne. Tatsächlich ähm, haben die Themen, für die ich stehe, durch den Preis auch nochmal Aufschub bekommen. Ich habe bis heute noch äh, Anfragen zu Themen, zu denen ich arbeite. Ähm, es gab relativ viel Zeitungsartikel und Interviews und so. Das heißt auch für Banying, also wo ich eben auch arbeite, war das auch sehr gut ähm, und ähm, auch das zu sehen, dass auch die Idee funktioniert, also das hat sie sich ja überlegt. Ich meine, äh, sie war ja sehr krank am Ende und hat in dieser Krankheitszeit eine Idee entwickelt, ähm, die ich genial finde und die einfach auch funktioniert, also in meinem Fall auf jeden Fall funktioniert hat. Anne Klein stiftete der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung den Anne Klein-Frauenpreis, damit auch in Zukunft das Engagement von Frauen für Menschenrechte, Gleichberechtigung und sexuelle Selbstbestimmung gefördert wird.
Ja, noch einmal ganz. And once again, thank you so much for this wonderful music um, and the opening of our award ceremony. Once again, from my side, a warm welcome here to our award ceremony. Dear Prasanna, dear Mrs. Budenbender, a warm welcome for this ninth presentation already of uh, the Anne Klein Women's Prize. Um, I am very pleased uh, that we've been able to win you, Mrs. Budenbender, for the laudatory speech. Um, this uh, is really a big honor. Together with uh, Prasanna Getu, you have uh, helped inaugurate uh, the National Emergency Call, for, uh, Call Center for Women. Not only have you visited Prasanna, but uh, you have helped uh, create this room in Chennai in 2018. I'm also looking forward to your laudatory speech and would like to thank you that you've made it possible and to create continuity for your commitment uh, for women in the whole world that are affected by discrimination and violence. Thank you so much for coming. Prasanna Getu. Prasanna Getu is accompanied by some of her comrades in arms and some family members. I would especially like to welcome her daughter, Divya. There she is. Here she has come today from Chennai to listen to her mother. And then again, I would like to warmly welcome her son, Abhinav. And what I really like to hear that uh, he is professor in my hometown of Freiburg, where he teaches robotics at the university. And then I would like to welcome her brother, who is Ravindra, and her sister-in-law. Both of you are warm welcome this evening. Please feel just like uh, if you were at home. And for you, dear Prasanna, I think it's wonderful to be accompanied by your family members and uh, to feel the support at this very special day. The 2nd of March is the day that Anna would have turned 70. And uh, with her prize, we celebrate Anna herself and her many political, legal, and social successes for whom she has fought and worked so hard. Anna has uh, worked uh, throughout her life against discrimination and violence. And already in the 70s, uh, like we've seen in the film, she has uh, founded a legal advice center and has fought for the first uh, women's safe house in Berlin. Later on then, as a senator, she secured the financial existence of uh, the women's safe houses. Um, she abolished the financial safe participation for women who sought protection there. This is something she had to fight for because beforehand women had to participate financially to protect women before violence, to offer precise help is uh, a mission of or was a mission of her life. And this is how this is linked to the today's winner, Prasanna Getu. With Prasanna, we honor a woman who in 2001 began to provide protection to women in Chennai in southern India, uh, women that have experienced domestic violence uh, with a specific offer, a holistic offer of support. She and her organization, International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care, offer women in acute need shelters, accompanies them in hospitals medically, and psychosocially, which is all the more important. She gives comfort to women and helps them to get back on their feet. After having experienced violence, uh, women want to lead a self-determined life in freedom and dignity. And this is what Prasanna enables these women. With her organization, she carries out prevention work tries to break down the structural violence in India and change the patriarchal image of women in society through awareness raising and training, maybe in the universities or in collaboration with the police. In yeah, I don't know if you're aware of that fact. According to studies uh, by the G20 and the Thomas Reuters Foundation, is the most dangerous country in the world for women. It even leaves behind countries like Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Afghanistan, or Yemen. 
The news that uh, have just reached us uh, again from New Delhi are terrifying. Many people dead, hundreds injured, and countless women who were the victims of sexual assault and violence are the sad outcome of the riots by Hindu nationalist uh, movements and um, mobs against the Muslim minority in India. Every day in India, there are honor killings, rapes, femicides, dowry killings, girl killings, violence against women and girls. The good news is that more and more young women and men are opposing this violence in India. They are protesting everywhere in India against the violence, are fighting for women's rights. Prasanna just told me yesterday when we were talking that she has high hopes for this young generation, even though she empathizes that uh, the patriarchal structures and ways of thinking are deeply rooted in Indian society. Prasanna just said that uh, it might need a few generations more in order for us to have a different mindset. But uh, together with uh, her comrades in arms, she is one of those that is fighting hard to make this change of mindset possible. Violence against women in their own families, unfortunately, is part of everyday life for many women in India. One third of the married women are abused by their husband or his family. Every tenth woman experiences severe domestic and sexual domestic violence. Flame or acid burns or acid attacks on women are widespread in India, although they are now considered a crime by law. Statistics show that there are about 90,000 victims, and we're only talking about flame and acid attacks. This is uh, the figure that uh, Prasanna named yesterday. For Prasanna and her organization, it is uh, a deep concern that uh, they are preoccupied and offering help to those women. They are dedicating their support to victims in in immediate uh, of the immediate environment of uh, flame and acid attacks. Per month, they are treating between 100 and 120 women. This uh, more than 60% of these women die from the consequences. Those who make it, unfortunately, do not receive the medical and psychological support they would need. And this is where Prasanna and her helpers start with their work. They first provide the victims uh, with medical care in hospitals. Um, this is what they may, uh, may do in government-owned hospitals. They encourage them to return to life. They give them courage and work with women on new life perspectives. Domestic and sexual violence, it occurs in India in all social strata, castes, or religious affiliations. Acid and flame attacks, according to Prasanna, tend to accumulate in the lower classes, while women from the upper class tend to be found poisoned or hanged. Prasanna says that uh, the higher the social status, the more likely it is that there will be grave efforts to cover up the violence. It is thanks to you, dear Prasanna, that in India, the first emergency number for victims of acid and, fa and flame burns was established. You and your comrades in arms will answer the emergency calls around the clock. Uh, you are helping precisely every single woman, and uh, you are on the spot uh, when we talk about helping um, out in the healing center for trauma-sensitive medical support. Dear Prasanna, you yourself say, Self-empowerment, that is such a big word. How does it work and what does it mean exactly? You keep trying to find an answer for every single woman. When I asked you yesterday, how do you bear with the burden and uh, the brutal environment you're working in, you told me that I'm always looking forward and I'm always considering the future of this woman. This has been very moving, and I think this is marking what you're doing on an everyday basis. 
The Anne Klein Prize is an award for those uh, who encourage, wants to think, and wants to be in solidarity with you, dear Prasanna, and with your organization, the International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care. We are full of admiration for your and all of your extraordinary concrete and political commitment to the victims of violence in India, in Chennai. Your work is unique in India. You are pioneers on a long road towards a more gender equitable society, towards a country where women hopefully can live freely and safely. Dear Prasanna, even after personal threats and hostilities, you always stand by the side of the surviving women and children and support them to make their way, no matter which one it may be. And this is something that you underlined uh, dearly yesterday, that uh, you are not pushing them in any direction. And uh, on behalf of the jury, I would like to congratulate you. I would like to wish you all the best of luck um, for your future and your work. Um, and have uh, the great pleasure to hand you the uh, Anne Klein Women's Prize together with Michaela Schreier. I would like to wish you the very best and thank you so much for all your commitment and hard work. And as I've already announced, I have now the pleasure and the honor to hand over to our speaker for the lottery speech, uh, Ms. Ecke Bükenbender, and I'm really looking forward to it and see you afterwards. Uh, it's really great to see so many people gathering tonight. Um, dear Ms. Goethe, dear Ms. Unmüsig, dear Ms. Bienek, and uh, dear members of the jury, ladies and gentlemen, and dear family members of Prasanna, it's a big pleasure to see you all here. And for the Bishop Mutze would be one of the people I would like to Welcome, especially this evening, because I'm glad to see you here. And I might tell you, it has been really a huge pleasure and honor when I heard of you having chosen me to hold this laudatory speech. I was really impressed. I've seen you on site working, and it is a huge honor for me to be here in front of you. It is now exactly two years to the month since I was in India, more precisely in Chennai, and had the pleasure to know you. I still have the pictures in my mind as if it was yesterday. Women moving very, very slowly. They did uh, physiotherapeutic exercises, and they did them very carefully and thoughtfully. And their faces were partly disfigured by the burns. Their arms and or legs are bandaged. They all had been victims of flame burn attacks. Flame attacks committed by members of their own families or the family of the husband or men that uh, were not accepted. I remember a woman who could hardly move her fingers, and yet with an iron will, she had tried to stick small metal rods into equally small holes on a wooden board. And uh, this is what she did in order to restore her fine motor skills, and every single movement cost her obvious effort. But she had the will, and you could really tell, because there where she was, she was given this will to fight. Of course, the first priority is to heal the body, the physical scars, and as best as possible the soul. But uh, the staff there also made it clear to her that she has a right to a better life, a nonviolent life, and yes, a self-determined life, that she can decide for herself what she wants and uh, what's important to her. She has learned, or at least was about to learn, that it is not she who is to blame for what happened to her, but solely and exclusively the person 
who made the attempt on her life. This may seem obvious to us, but for many women in India who've had similar experiences, this was not the case. All traditional role models uh, are too deep-seated, and uh, we have to fight with them as well here in Europe, um, according to which women have to subordinate themselves. Uh, although, of course, in India, we have uh, very much self-confident, self-determined, and emancipated women like our current prize winner here, as well as your daughter, your sister-in-law, and many others surely are. Yes, it surely takes some time. It might take some generations, but uh, I have had the possibility to know three generations of uh, women's rights activists, and they might not always have agreed, but I've always been encouraged to see women fighting despite uh, the most difficult conditions. The images of the woman, wounded women have been deeply engraved in my mind because they have moved me so much. It was really moving and impressive. And I was lucky enough um, to visit your institution, the International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care, or PCVC for short. The director showed us around the premises and told us about her work. And I remember quite clearly how impressed I was by this gentle yet strong woman who works uh, for women's rights in a country like India. For although their protection is enshrined in the Constitution, a large number of laws have been passed and there is now a broad public debate in India about them. The social reality of most women is still characterized by systematic discrimination and disadvantage. Those role models are deeply rooted and uh, still determine their daily lives. You've just mentioned it. In the Global Gender Gap Index of the World Economic Forum, India fell from the 108th place in 2018 to the 112th place out of a total of 149 countries in 2019. Violence and sexual assaults against women are a massive problem in India. Ms. Onmudji, you said so. 30% of women are actually affected by it in their life. I won't mention too many figures, but I still think that they illustrate very well the environment in which this courageous woman is active. And they show how great the task is she sets herself. Ladies and gentlemen, this woman is Dr. Prasanna Ghetto, who will be awarded the Anne Klein's Women's Prize tonight. With this award, you said so, the Heinrich Böll Foundation annually supports women who have distinguished themselves through their outstanding commitment to the realization of gender democracy. And in this respect, I could hardly imagine a more worthy winner than you, Dr. Ghetto. Congratulations. Since 2001, you are campaigning for women's rights in India. That year, together with two fellow students, you founded the organization PCVC, which works for the victims of domestic and other forms of interpersonal violence. The team of helpers consists of psychologists, social workers, and uh, former w victims as well. Through the crisis intervention service, affected women receive information on how to deal with police stations, which is an important aspect in order to help uh, them to go and to approach the police stations, to not be fearful. There's help uh, in uh, discussions, debates with their families, uh, support for children. Uh, of course, we have the legal advice, uh, medical assistance. Um, and this special support for children that uh, have to live through the same situation when women have to leave this brutal home. Over the years, the offering of your organization has grown to meet the needs of women and their children. For example, special police stations uh, with uh, trained female staff are set up because women seem to be more likely to turn to women in their need than men. 
when Ms. get to observe that many women brought their children along, then you created emergency shelters for women and children alike where they could recover and uh, could uh, easily think about how to move forward because this, of course, is economically difficult and challenging to move apart. A treatment offer called SMILES for children who have been victims of domestic violence was also developed because it was recognized that boys from such families often become perpetrators when they become adults, while girls tend to choose violent partners later on. So the children repeat the patterns they have lived through. The aim of the program is to teach children to value nonviolent relationships. And I think this program alone cannot be appreciated enough because only if we start with the children, with a new generation, then real change in people's thinking and acting can take place because the children are our future, our future present, and therefore we would like to see them live a better life. And this is where we have to start. In March 2018, when I traveled to India with my husband, who is the federal president, um, and uh, when I had uh, the uh, great pleasure to meet you, Ms. Ghetto, in Chennai, then I well, as well, I had the great honor to initiate the hotline that we were been talking about, where affected women could get legal and medical advice from trained contact persons. This hotline is already well established. Uh, you told me so, and uh, I'm really very happy about that. I think a call is certainly easier for many women than to come directly to PCVC. A phone call is a first step, which is the important thing that we overcome this barrier, because uh, the shame about what happened is paradoxically often quite considerable about among the victims, so that uh, they yeah, have this shame upon them about what has happened to them. So the phone call is really the first step to initiate the contact. PCVC also does a lot in the field of prevention, which is highly important. You go to schools, universities, and even to companies. You offer further training in order to break down gender-specific prejudices and role stereotypes and all different fields, not only in schools and universities, but as well in companies where men and women work. And uh, by doing this, uh, you try to prevent violence in the work, at the workplace and in civil partnerships. When you, Mr. Ghetto, realized that more and more lesbian women and transgender people were seeking your help, you created support services for them as well, for their special needs. This uh, would have been something any client would have been particularly pleased about, I'm sure of it, because not only as a senator, you've seen it in the short film, she campaigned for women's rights, uh, has created uh, safe houses for women and girls who ran away from home. She was an outspoken lesbian politician. And in the end of the 80s, uh, this really was not uh, a, uh, an easy task. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, what impresses me so much about Dr. Getter is her resolute but unagitated manner. This is really impressive that uh, I think this is something you, you've had to learn over the years to keep calm. And uh, when we're calm, then of course we have a lot more force and power to work with. You were telling me about your work and organization as if it was the most natural thing in the world, but it's not the most natural thing in the world. You don't think in big words or big deeds. You simply do it. You see a problem and you find a solution to it. And everything you do, you do 100%. You don't know or you don't only go half the way. You won't rest until the solution is found. And when the other two founders uh, decided to leave the uh, organization in 2002, 2005, you were faced with the choice of giving up or continuing. And of course, you continued. This is uh, what uh, marks you so very well. And since then, uh, you were 
solely responsible for all activities, although you're supported by an advisory board of members and staff. I already asked myself when we visited you how you could bear all these fates of the many women because I was really profoundly shocked. I wasn't really able to do anything else because I really had to digest all that I've seen in the visit, the wounds, the stories, the grief, the long road to self-esteem and uh, finally, in the best of all cases, to self-determination. And you told me that it's not that you don't care, but there's a reflex in you that uh, doesn't want to get stuck with your own feelings, but you immediately switch to solution finding. You immediately think about resolving the problem of how these women can go forward. And I think this, of course, helps women in need a lot more than over-identifying with their fate. Um, because your daily work is not a heroic deed for you, but so natural. She didn't even believe that you would even be honored for your work. And this, of course, is uh, marking that you're so much focused on your work. But even your own history is not self-evident because you grew up in a extremely protected environment in a wealthy family. You were driven everywhere to school, to friends, to shopping, and there was always someone waiting for you to drive you home again. Well, 21 years, so you got married. It was an arranged marriage. You had two wonderful children that are sitting among us tonight. But... Uh, you wanted to rebel yourself, um, or at least a little bit, uh, much um, to the annoyance of your mother-in-law. You wore jeans when you were pregnant, and then you said you were a wild child in other respects. Um, and I think this is exactly what is needed for this biography and for this commitment. I think we need some people that are not adjusted, and we need some rebelness, so I think uh, you really are the right person to do so. Early on, you were fascinated by crime stories and actually wanted to solve crimes yourself, but then your parents uh, wanted you to study something decent. So first of all, you made your master's in ge geology, and then you further developed and uh, added criminology to your studies and uh, got your doctorate in that subject. During a study visit in victimology at the Tokiwa University in Japan, um, uh, you got to know and recognize uh, successful projects for victims of domestic violence. And you acknowledge that victims of domestic violence need a different form of, of support than victims of other forms of violence because it is happening in a known environment and the perpetrators are loved persons uh, and uh, because many young people, in that case children, are involved. So this is quite different and uh, you acknowledged uh, the huge need in your home country and when you were back from Japan, you did not hesitate for long but found it uh, um, the organization with two fellow students. Originally, the offer was directed at men as well, but within a year, I think you realized that it was 99% of women who turned up for help. And um, you said, so you never had to do any advertising for the hotline, where it soon got around that there was a place for women in need. Some women came on their own, Others had to be brought in by friends or family members. Sometimes we need friends or family members or people close to our hearts that uh, support us. And this is still the case today. And there are more of them on one hand because violence against women and girls is not decreasing, but also, at least in my impression, now there's much more talk about it in Indian society. Um, and uh, the form of violence is officially outlawed. And uh, I have the impression that uh, from the government side, uh, this violence is, uh, yeah, is outlawed. Um, for you, it is uh, a sense of hope. Um, I am quite hopeful to see this uh, debate opening, although you tell us that the situation is still quite challenging, but uh, there is a certain progress, and this is really inspiring. Many women have 
known that they have the right to self-determination. Some of them might take a while, and uh, this is, of course, uh, the case for us as well. When you've made the first experience with violence, you do not turn to a help hotline, but in the end, they do so. And this is a change of mindset and is a positive change. PCVC has always worked with the government because they have realized that alone they can only do so much against domestic violence. So the government is needed and uh, the government in turn has acknowledged that uh, we have to secure the safety of women because they are 50 percent of our population and we cannot leave them aside. And the experience and the knowledge gained from their many years of work will certainly not have gone unheard. So you've had your say and you still have this influence. The PCVC staff, in any case, uh, have always been well supported by the government over the years. And this also gives you hope that things will change for the better in the long run. So how does a woman? that at first sight did not experience any violence herself and uh, for many years uh, might not even have noticed anything from the side of society. How does this woman come to find an organization for victims of violence? You yourself say that uh, many times people who have survived something terrible start an aid organization in order to cope out with their own fate, but in order to teach others. But in your case, it's the way around. The original impulse uh, to help came from Japan, but then you realized uh, at a very early stage that uh, uh, there were solutions to be found for your former countrymen, uh, your fellow countrymen. But uh, only after many years of working with victims of domestic and interpersonal violence did you realize that there are differences between the different forms of violence, but every form weighs just as heavily and leaves consequences on the victim. And you understood that domestic violence is omnipresent and it exists across all the different social strata. It is not a phenomenon of poverty. And in doing so, you also realized you, that you yourself exposed to a form of violence. You were forced to live like your family and your husband's family would have decided for you. And uh, from this conclusion, you drew your own consequences and separated from your husband. You did no longer want to live this dual life to encourage women to claim their rights and then back home renounce your rights. This is uh, a sign of courage to be as outspoken. And you certainly served as a role model for others, although you certainly never intended to do so. You are so humble that what you're doing is in the center of your attention. And you said that you did not have any role models yourself because you're guided by values. Uh, you recognize that something is right and then you integrate it into your own actions. And if you recognize that something went wrong, then you drop it again. And this is very wise to do. Pragmatic, solution oriented, and yet always full of empathy. And what we've learned as well, that uh, the little free time you have, you like to spend with animals. Uh, your daughter is a veterinarian. And uh, instead of uh, just uh, enjoying it, you were thinking of opening up an animal shelter. You laughed back then, but I think you really mean it. Yeah. You want to be of help for other forms of life. So I'm sure that um, the uh, winner of uh, this and Klein Woman's Prize uh, will be of benefit for many of us, uh, for people, animals, or maybe plants or the climate. So we can all take a leave out of Dr. Ghetto's book. So in this spirit, I would like to thank you so much, uh, dear Ghetto, from the bottom of my heart for everything you've done for these women tested by fate. Not only are you saving their lives by removing them from their violent environment and providing them with the medical care they so much need. No, more than that, you are giving them back their dignity. Self-esteem and self-determination are the key to a better life for these women, and you are putting that key in their hands. The door, of course, they have to unlock their themselves. 
and what door they unlock is for them to decide. But uh, you at least uh, provide the tools to do so. And uh, we cannot thank you enough for that. The Anna Klein Women's Prize goes to you in more than justifiably so. Thank you so very, very much. Chakra, which is actually um, in charge to heal our sensitivity and to heal also um, um, wounds that have been, have been placed here. So I dedicate this meditation, music, to
Ja, danke schön für diese auch schöne meditative Musik und nochmal von meiner Seite. Many thanks for this very nice uh, meditative music. Thank you so much, Ms. Budenberger, for your empathy in the speech and the solidarity that you have expressed uh, for the work uh, of Prasanna that you've given us and yeah, as a gift to us. Thank you so much. Oh, Prasanna, now it's your turn. Please come to the stage. Der eine kleinen Frauenpreis ist nicht The uh, award, this Anne Klein Women's Award, is not only linked to this great laudatory speech and this nice ceremony. And uh, the, uh, the prize money that you will receive, but uh, with this very nice award with a feministic, feminist uh, design. Victims of discrimination and it's a sign for supporting internationally support uh, to those women who fight against this discrimination and it should give you strength for your further fight against violence and for equal rights for all people, for men and women. Congratulations. flowers to you and once again all the best for your work. Thank you so much. Welcome. I would like the jury to come to the stage as well. So we will take a photo with all the those uh, members of the jury who awarded the prize to you. No, it's fine. We will wait. We wait. Still we are complete. This direction? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, just for the photo, for the photo of the jury and the Yeah. Thank you. Okay, once again, Honestly, I haven't heard so much about myself. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Budenberger and uh, Barbara for the introductions. Uh, distinguished guests, respected First Lady, Ms. Budenberger, uh, Ms. Barbara, President, uh, HPS Foundation, friends and supporters, and uh, especially the jury, and friends and relatives of Anna Klein. Uh, foundation, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I most humbly thank the Heinrich Ball Surfing Foundation for honoring me with the Anna Klein Women's Award 2020. My endless gratitude with each one of you here for recognizing the cause my team and a community of supporters work for. An abuse that touches almost every woman at some point of her lifetime. Domestic violence or intimate partner violence and sexual violence. The nature of the abuse is such it leaves the victim feel guilty, blamed, stigmatized, even with her rationalizing the abuse. The International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care, known as PCVC to people back home, was started in 2001 with the primary goal of being a victim assistance center and a research organization. 
by three women, including myself, from the field of criminology and criminal justice. After a year's existence, we, the founders, experienced that a large number of victims who approached PCVC for assistance were domestic violence victims. From across the socioeconomic strata, like Ms. Burin Brada already spoke to you about it, in trying to provide support to these women, we stood exposed to the lack of government assistance programs, absence of dedicated domestic violence shelters, or medical and legal assistance. A dearth of rehabilitative spaces and resources, such as support groups, counseling, and rehabilitative therapy for women impacted by domestic violence and sexual violence. A shocking realization was that women facing domestic violence were often looked at as abnormal and treated for mental illness. These and more led to what we are today, an organization providing specialist domestic violence support services a wide range of programs to support women and children, as well as queer individuals. We uphold the belief that structural inequalities in society greatly disadvantage women and gender and sexual minorities, resulting in power differentials and interpersonal violence in relationships. This framework and practice ensure that all persons approaching us for support are treated with respect and dignity. Over the years, as we saw more and more women living in violent circumstances and identified and understood their needs and the impact of living in abusive relationships, we expanded our services to meet those needs. Many of our key projects came into being as a response to immediate needs identified by our clients. A cornerstone of our work are crisis intervention services for women and children, includes providing information, counseling and referrals, emergency shelter, legal advocacy, and planning for safety. Long-term support includes safe housing, legal assistance, education support for women and children, skill building support, employment, childcare, or simply a space to be, think and get in touch with yourself. We work closely with the all women police stations in the city, so offer crisis counseling and connect women approaching the police station to counseling and other support services. We also partner with other government agencies to continue to improve, improve responses to domestic violence. Mm -hmm. In India and elsewhere, it is easy to blame women for not leaving or attribute violence to use of alcohol or mental health or childhood trauma. But this glosses over the conditioned and generational nature of patriarchal violence and allows communities and systems to overlook the culpability of perpetrators and place the onus solely on women to change the circumstances of their lives. While not leaving a violent situation is a woman's fault, the violence itself is often rationalized away. At PCVC, we have over the years designed interventions that expand the choices available to survivors and help them make decisions regarding their lives that can transcend financial dependence or cultural and societal norms. One such intervention is the provision of educational support to children of survivors under our SMILES program. We have found over the years that many survivors of domestic violence continue to stay in the violent relationships to avoid any disruption to their children's education and when that is taken care of, many of them are able to take, make the decision to leave. As a personal ally of the LGBTQI movement, we at PCVC have over the past few years also worked hard to make sure that our services are more inclusive and open to people with different sexual and gender identities. We believe that solidarity and collaborative action with our LGBTQI family is important to realize our collective dream of living lives free of gender-based violence and other tyrannies. It has been a process of learning, change, and growth for us as we have challenged our own unconscious biases and opened our shelters and crisis services to LGBTQI people. We have worked with and learned from queer organizations to better our services and ensure that we are providing a safe and nourishing environment where our clients can live their reality without fear. As one of a few available crisis shelters that currently supports queer individuals in India, we are constantly striving to expand available support and always keep our doors open. 
I'm happy to share with you here that the prize money of the Anaclin Award will be a seed money for the launch of our new project, Thara, which means stars, uh, to offer support for LGBTQI people. To highlight PCVC's flagship project, Vidyal, which means new dawn in our language, I would like to share a few words of an acid attack survivor that's etched in me. I engaged with her 24 hours from the horrific incident. She gripped my hand so tight I could feel it in my bones. Open quotes, I don't know if I'm dead or alive. I can't see anything, it's all dark. And I'm told I'm okay, not to worry, I'll be okay. Please, please, tell me what's happening to my body. I'm scared, very scared. Is he around? Close quotes. Vidyal, a project for women burn survivors was initiated in 2003 at a local government hospital that to date gets about 100, 120 women every month impacted by flame and acid burns. 90% of the admitted cases are either self-inflicted or inflicted by the husband and in-laws because of domestic violence. We began with addressing the immediate needs in the hospitals by providing nutritious food and drinking water for speedy healing of the wounds, disposable gowns and bed sheets to reduce the risk of infections and psych psychological support. As we engaged with the patients, we grew to understand that trauma caused to burn survivors is so profound that its impact escalates with every passing day changing the way they see the world and the world sees them for weeks, months, and even years after the incident. The need for long-term interventions begins right from the critical stages up to recovery. And we also realized that there were no comprehensive post-burn rehabilitation services addressing the physical and psychosocial requirements of women burn survivors. The common elements of trauma, it was expected, the person was unprepared, and there was nothing the person can do, could do to stop it from happening. Have different connotations when it comes to acid and burn attack survivors. It's not just how much physical destruction the incident has caused, what determines how traumatic it is, but also the survivor's experiences of the underlying trauma of interpersonal violence, which, is by, which by its nature is chronic. Many a times we get the question, can these women burn survivors get back to normal? For most of them, they defined a new normal because of the ways in which their belief systems and views of the world have been fundamentally altered. They need much more than treatment. They need emotional validation and community support to be able to integrate back to life. Vidyal now has a multidisciplinary team that comprises of psychosocial workers, physiotherapists, wound care specialists, welfare officers, and caretakers to provide rehabilitation services to women burn survivors after a hospital discharge. Outreach services assess needs, follow up with the patients after discharge, and deliver services such as home rehabilitation and wound care, and motivate women to join our recovery and healing center for women burn survivors. The residential and rehabilitation facility offers round-the-clock care such as physical rehabilitation, wound and scar care, individual psychological counseling, family counseling, peer support, and activities that promote social inclusion. This comprehensive model of care covers the spectrum from hospital and acute care to ongoing treatment, rehabilitation, and reintegration to society. The model encourages women burn survivors with a simple and powerful message. You can get back to living a life of your choice. We are with you through this journey. We have witnessed the journey of nearly 5,000 women burn survivors from being victims to survivors to thrivers, leading lives of their choice. In the past six months, we have extended our work to 11 more government hospitals in the state with the sole aim to provide support to every woman impacted by burn injuries in the state and a dedicated national support line for women burn survivors, providing emergency assistance and guidance to nearest burn units, first aid options, and post-discharge follow-ups follow up to recovery. 
Our work also encompasses stakeholder, engage stakeholder engagement and capacity building for civil society organizations, paramedics and healthcare providers across the state. We have pledged to work together to ensure that acid and other burn survivors have access to services in an environment that is inclusive, welcoming, destigmatizing, and non traumatizing. 2020 happens to be our 20th year of working towards achieving our goal of ending violence against women. Ahead of marking our upcoming 20th anniversary, as Ms. Budenberg had mentioned, two years ago we asked ourselves who else but us? and with all determination initiated the National Domestic Violence Hotline, a 24-hour multi-channel hotline for women facing domestic or sexual abuse. Still in its infant stage, the hotline receives an average of five new calls a day from women or their families, friends, or colleagues, or employers. I'm happy to share here that the infrastructure of the hotline room was supported by the Consulate General of Germany at Chennai and inaugurated by no other than our first lady, uh, Ms. Buden Bender. <laughs> As a service provider providing support to women post-violence, we at PCVC are aware that when there is a kick with the boots or throw of words on a woman, it does not happen in a vacuum. It's historical. We believe that to end violence against women, we need to eradicate it from the roots. For this, we work with people across the society to bring a positive shift in the attitudes, mindsets, and practices which perpetrate violence and discrimination against women. A momentum is gathering, awareness is rising, and we truly believe that more and more people will not just reach out for support when it happens or report violence, but will work together to prevent violence and take collective action. This award is a great honor to the tireless work of my colleagues and team back home and an ever supportive board of trustees. I dedicate this to every one of them and take this opportunity to thank them for their priceless time and effort towards this cause. <laughs> to my co-founders, Usha Rani and Hema Ramachandran for your vision and dedication in the infant years of PCVC that has allowed us to get here. A big thank you. This evening is also special to me as I have a handful of people here from my life's journey who have shown how much they value my work by traveling thousands of miles from across the globe to stand by me at this moment. My brother and sister-in-law, Dr. Ravindra Getu and Padma Getu, my children, Dr. Abhinav Valada and Dr. Divya Valada, both of whom seem to have chosen work in a totally non-human environment. <laughs> the field of robotics and veterinary sciences, perhaps a result of growing up witnessing my work. I don't know. <laughs> my closest childhood friend, Sharmila John, who has come here all the way from the US. A big thank you. Friends I have won over the years of doing this work, my dear and first German friend, Karen Greaves. <laughs> and members from Medica Mondial, a big thank you for trusting and believing in PCVC's work and valuing my contribution and nominating me for this prestigious award. Thank you. Friends from the Fraunhelf Foundation, Dorothea Schneider, Marion von Galek, uh, Silky Hogg, and Christine Smith, who for more than 10 years have been giving their most valuable time fundraising in Germany for PCVC every single year, and have been most passionate and committed supporters of our work. A huge thank you. At times, we meet people who we instantly connect with, and that connection goes a long way. Didem and Ahim Fabig, who are with us today. I met them when Ahim was the Consul General of Germany, Chennai. They demonstrated an absolute, unconditional faith in our work that was humbling to say the least. 
and it's they who made it possible for the first lady to visit PCVC during her visit with the president in 2018 and understand our work. It's special to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Hen Henrich Bull's Stefan Foundation, for making this event more than an award ceremony for me, a day that will go into the chapters of my life and the life of the organization as a landmark, landmark day. I have a gift for each one of you here, greetings and loads of love from my mother from India, uh, who couldn't make this long journey to be with us today. Ulrike Kochong, Felix, uh, Josh, and several other HBS Foundation members. <laughs> no amount of words can suffice to express my gratitude. Uh, for the last two days, the number of meetings I've had and great discussions. Thank you, thank you so much. And you've made this day so, so special for me. Uh, amazing, thank you so much. We are concluding our concert with Rag Hamsadhani. This is a South Indian Rag, it's a, but we are playing in North Indian style because Mrs. Gateway is today here. So to honor her, we are concluding our recital with Rag Hamsadhani.
und beschwingter Aus. Oh, what a nice uh, outtake for Rima Maturi and Stephanie. Thank you so much for your marvelous uh, musical accompanying. Yes, what a ceremony under conditions of a virus. Thank you so much for your patience, for your attention. And then I would like to thank uh, a few more people that have contributed to the successful event. Uh, many thanks, Ulrike Sichon, for your efforts, for your great preparatory work. Uh, thank you so much. Then, uh, thanks to the Department of Asia, Prasanna said, so she is, of course, uh, not only here for the ceremony, she has led uh, uh, many discussions, she has met many more people, and uh, we hope that this helps to disseminate further the idea of your work, uh, what it does, and how it helps people in your society. So many thanks to the Department of Asia. And then thank you so much to all the interpreters here in the back of the room. Thank you for your work, because otherwise we wouldn't even been able to communicate here. Then, of course, I have to express my gratitude for the event management team, Eva Clark, uh, for the organization, for the seating arrangement. Uh, thank you so much as well to the technical team here for the conference technology. Only with the team effort are we able to organize this event. Thank you so much to all of you. And I would like to invent, uh, invite you to our little reception. We have a flying buffet in this night. Uh, we are considering uh, the requirements of the Robert Koch Institute. They do allow us to have something to eat. But I'm really sorry because this is usually a part of the event. But we had to abide by the rules. and. This night we will dance a lot less, but there will be a DJ that uh, will entertain you this night. Uh, please enjoy the evening, talk to one another, be courageous, and feel at home here in our Heinrich Bell Foundation. I wish you a very nice evening and uh, see you next time.